you've been hearing through the course of this uh, Congress about the legacy goal that's already been set. The goal is crowdsourcing from the ECHO community, a document to be called the Kaohsiung Protocol. This will be a framework identifying major trends and strategies to help the international meetings industry to thrive now and into the future. So with us to introduce the concept and a further panel is ICA board member Greg Talley. Greg, this is going to be very exciting. I know all yours. Hello, Robert. And first, let me say how excited I am to be here with my ICA colleagues. And I realize that here is a relative term for all of us. Um, but as we're coming to understand, uh, we all have to deal um, with uh, new, new forms of relativity in our ind industry as we go forward. So yes, I'm very excited as well to introduce the Kaohsiung Protocol. And a lot of folks have said kind of, what is it? What are we talking about here? And what we're building together is, A, based on original research with our client base, come to an understanding of what is the reality that our clients are facing and what does that mean for us? And how we're going to do this together is through prioritizing a group of trends, both macro and micro, that our clients have identified is rocking their world. And when we prioritize what that means for us, we're then going to be in a position to build strategies by sector to align against those trends that our clients are dealing with so that we can be more effective partners and start to get a sense of where do we go together to bring this industry back and keep it the force we know it can be to aid our governments and our, literally our world, recover and go forward and develop. So that's what we're all about. You're going to need an iPad, you're going to need your cell phone out to be ready to play with us today uh, with what we do. But first of all, when we started talking about this, we knew we couldn't do it by ourselves. So we went out and found a group that is already doing this type of methodology in our industry, primarily with destination marketing organizations, but the process uh, and methodology applies for what we're going to be doing together as we go forward. The folks that are helping us with that are the folks with MMGY Next Factor, and I'm delighted to introduce Paul Wimet, uh, the president and CEO of MMGY Next Factor. Paul, over to you. Well, thank you, Greg, and hello, everyone. We're delighted to be working with, with ICA on this important project. Um, as we see uh, the leisure market begin to bounce back, there continues to be a lot of debate and uncertainty about the events industry. Um, we're hoping that with your input today and, and during this project that we'll be able to uh, determine and, and hopefully shape the future of our important um, events industry. Let me begin, so, so thanks again for, for participating here today. Um, let me begin by introducing the project team that will be working with me on this project from Next Factor, Jim McCall, Greg Oates, and Sharin Jafari. And you have our commitment that we do not want to just do another research piece um, here. We want to actually work with you to put together a policy strategy framework to move the events industry forward. Next slide, please. Now we started this project in August and the first phase is, as Greg already mentioned, this is now we're focused on what are the trends shaping the industry? Uh, we've done uh, a lot of desktop research, we've done some interviews, and uh, we sent out a survey to over 600 meeting uh, professionals. Today, what we want from you is your input and prioritization of the trends that we've identified. In, a, in October, we're going to uh, work with the ICA sectors to, uh, to identify uh, the key strategies that should be adopted by our industry. We're going to do another session like this one today on October 22nd at the next Global Live event meeting to focus on strategies and then present the final results at the ICA Congress 
on November 2nd. So that's an overview. It's a, a short project, uh, lots, lots of uh, moving parts, but uh, um, we're really looking forward to working with all of you um, during, this, during this process. Next slide, slide please. Um, so far, we've really been encouraged by the number of responses that we've had. We've had over uh, 80 responses from meeting planners from around the world, 30 countries so far. Uh, next slide, please. We've had a good cross-section of respondents. Uh, more than half were association uh, leaders, but we've also got agency third-party meeting planners as well as corporate meeting professionals. So we're encouraged by the uh, level of engagement so far. I'm going to turn it back over to Greg to um, um, introduce the panelists for today. Great. Thanks, Paul. So to help us um, with this whole project um, and help it come together and also to be able to take advantage of their insights, we've assembled an advisory group of about 30 industry leaders literally from all over the globe and representing all of our sectors. Um, four of them are joining us today to chat a little bit as we go through the prioritization so that we can get the benefit of their insights. Let me introduce them to you. First, um, Toby Matabani from Cape Town International Convention Center in Cape Town, South Africa. Second, Fernando Gobran with Messe Frankfurt in Argentina. Third, Rene Chu with the Kaohsiung City Government in Kaohsiung Chinese Taipei. And last but not least, Leslie Zeck with the International and American Associations for Dental Research in the United States. Great, so thank you for, for joining us. And I'm gonna kick right off before we, we're coming to you all next, so get those devices ready, but I've got a question for Leslie and a, and a question for Renee. Um, go, thank you. Um, Leslie, one of the big takeaways is we asked our clients um, that you just saw Paul reference, looking forward on their events as they come back or as they um, pivot uh, into virtual or hybrid setting, have their success metrics changed for those events and for their partnerships within the industry supply chain as a result of COVID-19? and 70% said yes. That's a pretty significant number. So tell us in your world as an international association, what's changed? What does that look like right now? What are you dealing with? Um, because while we're in the event space and that's our piece of it, we think there's something else going on here. What is that? Absolutely. Pivot is such a crazy word that we've all added to our vocabularies these days. But now is now. Six months ago, we weren't even thinking about this. And look at us. We're going 100% virtual for the rest of 2020. That's a huge change for all of us in associations. And let me first back up and say thank you to ICA for allowing associations to be a part of this organization. What a timely move you made to bring us there because we do need to partner together. In our own association, we have even moved one of our staff members to be a digital strategist, a digital and virtual expert. So we made that move very quickly. This is how quickly we're moving and pivoting. Uh, our staff roles have changed. Our meeting priorities have changed. There's so much going on, but look at us adapting so quickly. So one of the things I'm hearing from you and some of the other research that we got is associations are literally fighting for survival and rethinking everything, membership, governance models, everything right now, because it's all in such a state of flux and we don't know about revenue. Is that something you're seeing as well in your organization that's even bigger than just the event issues? Absolutely. Anybody who had to cancel a meeting this year has lost revenue, not just the association side, but look at our partners as well. There is no business going into these cities. We do have concerns about membership moving forward for the future. The economic factors that we learned about early today are sobering statistics of if people are not having the money to join associations and attend meetings in the future, that's a huge problem for us as an association. 
Right. One of my big takeaways I think we're going to be talking about a lot is this digitization of everything, particularly within associations, and that has an impact, as we know, on number of bodies attending anything. Renee, let me shift to you. As a destination now, and as we're in the business event space, and we're hearing our clients' needs and wants and expectations and success factors are changing so much, how does a destination react to that? Yes, um, thank you for the question. Uh, in Taiwan, we, uh, as you know, that uh, we are very fortunate uh, not to be affected by the te- uh, pandemic very much, and we don't have lockdown. And but we do have strict uh, border control, and this is to make sure that uh, we provide a safe and healthy environment to uh, all of us. But uh, since June this year, uh, National Association meetings has coming back. Uh, medical conferences were held. So yes, we are still going uh, digital. But in July, uh, my office hosted a workshop face to face with our local uh, stakeholders uh, to share case studies on how digital solutions uh, could help them uh, during the pandemic. So we value business event very much, but uh, business event industry are always with uh, changes. So it's beyond the pandemic. A few years ago, we had financial crisis and uh, all the natural disaster in the past. And uh, I believe we will have more coming in the future. But so as destination, we need to embrace changes and to have to be uh, adaptive and uh, be resilient. So uh, Kaohsiung and Taiwan, we see the importance of business event. And so uh, even in this difficult time, we still continue to uh, support ICA 2020 and to support uh, business event. So um, yeah, we have a very well established uh, digital infrastructure and technology, but the uh, pandemic has, it in, encourages us to think more about the possibility of more advanced digital solution to uh, simulate the uh, physical meeting environment. And also we want to add value to it with content design. So as partner, we need to be innovative and to, promote, uh, to provide more solutions to our clients. So a uh, face-to-face meeting is irreplaceable but uh, and it creates trust uh, economy. So uh, for example, the food we prepare uh, for the guests to come in uh, ICA 2020 Congress in Kaohsiung, the aroma, the cultural experience and the interaction, these cannot be uh, transmitted online. So um, from the destination point of view, I would want to encourage face-to-face meeting and uh, we, but we will uh, continue to put effort in uh, offering safe and healthy environment uh, so we can welcome more uh, business event stakeholders. Yes. Great, thank you. And Paul, to take us forward now and involve our complete global audience, I'm flipping it back to you. Super, so now what we want is, um, we're gonna shift gears and we want your feedback. We're going to shift to uh, uh, another uh, platform here, and we want you to take out your phone or another uh, another device, open a browser, and uh, go to www.menti.com. Once you get there, you type in the code 7569904, and you will end up on our list of trends. No spaces are required uh, in that code. Now, what we've done, our team has prepared um, a list of 30 macro trends. These are broad economic, social, political trends, uh, and then another 43 micro trends. These are trends specific to the industry. And what we wanna do with the time remaining is to have you prioritize those trends. We have seven pages. We're gonna have to move through this very quickly, probably about four minutes uh, 
per uh, per page. Uh, but we want your input today on how significant, how much of an impact will these trends have on our industry over the next uh, two to uh, five years. Okay, so um, uh, we're going to show the results live. And um, I'll turn it back over to Greg to, to lead the voting. Great. So if we could see the first slide. So um, this is the first of uh, 30 macro trends and the voting is open so you can vote and the results will show live as we go through this. But Toby, Toby let me go to you as you look at, at this list. What jumps out? What's, uh, what do you think is of major significance that we should be focusing on? Well, Greg, I definitely think that uh, the acceleration of the digital economy is, uh, is a mega trend uh, that we will see growing exponentially in the next few years. I mean, it, we've already seen it with uh, the onset of COVID that, uh, you know, from deliver online um, purchasing of goods and services, whether it's food, whether it's household goods, um, where we have seen contactless um, transactions happening, where you you no longer paying with money, and you no longer having to punch in your, your your pin code if you're paying with a credit card, the use of QR codes, uh, digital education, uh, which has become quite uh, prevalent now with people not being able to attend in person to universities. I think the acceleration of the digital economy is something that that COVID has really, the word is pivoted, and we'll see a growth of that quite significantly. Right. And, and we're living it, right? I mean, in our space, we're living it Absolutely. because of what we've had to do as, as organizers for our own events um, yeah. that couldn't take place physically. But what we also learned is it perhaps has broadened our reach and access to parts of the world yes. and participants that we couldn't reach otherwise. So there's pluses and minuses, upsides and downsides to, to all of this. So Fernando, let me I shift think, to you. Think, when you look at this list here, yeah. what, what jumps out at you? Hi, Greg. Uh, well, it's, it's moving, no? It's moving uh, very fast and very consistent, the, the pool, but uh, let me reflect on the, the leadership at local and regional government levels. Uh, what we learned after six months of uh, terrible lockdowns around the world, that we need uh, a serious commitment and leadership of the local authorities in order to help us uh, to drive our business. We hear a lot of uh, government decisions, but we are not hearing enough about government support to our industry. And I think that this is the moment to start discussing this issue and try to move our politicians into the right direction together with us to support our industry. Great point. So this whole issue that we've seen, particularly in the U.S., um, we've seen mayors and governors react better, um, more forcefully, with more leadership than our national government. And it's that sort of increase or change in terms of where do we go to get the influence and impact that we need for the advocacy um, in our space. Great. Paul, how are we doing on overall results and are we ready to flip? Yeah, they're coming in uh, fast and furious. Maybe give another 30 seconds here to, to move forward. I think clearly on this slide, we've got a, a clear winner in terms of the acceleration of digital economy. But uh, let's give another um, 20 seconds, then we'll move on. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see there's clearly a, a leader and then a second tier um, of trends that everyone feels kind of relatively are the, the same in terms of impact for us. So. Uh, Hold on, and then we'll flip to the next one. We've got 20 more macro trends and then about 40 micro trends. So a little bit of a ways to go. But this is this Perfect. is great because it really tells us um, there's consolidation. Um, we saw that in Jean-Pierre's message to us. Um, that wasn't good news for our industry. If you noticed, first to be hit the hardest, last to come back, but his caveat on that was, only with significant consolidation in our space. So um, I think that's going to be a reality we're going to face, particularly if we're living in this 
um, for the next year um, before we even can kind of come start to come out of it. Great. I think we're ready, Greg, to move on to the next. Great. So here is the, the second list of 10 macro trends for you to go ahead and do exactly the same thing. And Renee, I'm going to flip to you. Is When you look at this list, is there something that uh, jumps out for you and uh, your colleagues in Kaohsiung? Yeah. Yeah. Um about the increased recognition of uh, climate change impacts, um, like I said earlier, uh, we have to be always uh, prepared for changes and it's beyond a uh, pandemic. Uh, Kaohsiung being a harbor city is prone to uh, many threats, uh, natural or caused by human behavior. So uh, we always stay alert, take precautions and learn from other cities experience. So uh, uh, then when it comes uh, in the face of adversity, we can react uh, sh uh, swiftly. So like the uh, proverb uh, says, be prepared for danger in time of peace. So uh, in 2016, uh, Kaohsiung has initiated uh, this Global Harbor Cities Forum, and we have invited leaders of the harbor cities uh, from around the world to uh, come to Kaohsiung to discuss uh, threats and uh, trends that affect uh, harbor cities in the next decades. So uh, climate change is always on the top of our uh, list. And like I say, Kaohsiung, uh, we always think ahead and be prepared. Great. And um, this is something we're all living literally around the globe uh, as climate change continue to have an impact. And governments, my government in particular, um, prefers clearly to put its head in the sand on this. Um, yet we're living it very directly between fires and hurricanes happening as we speak um, that are impacting an ever growing number of Americans. Fernando, let me jump back to you on this uh, on this slide. Was there something else here that jumped out um, that you wanted to bring attention to? Yes, I, I, I choose two, Greg, because uh, awareness of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I believe that is uh, something that had to be with us in our agenda forever. Uh, of course, there are a lot of things uh, done in the industry linked with this, but uh, the society and uh, all the people around the world need to seriously reflect on this, on this issue. And what surprised me positive that this uh, public-private sector collaboration jumps up. Uh, I link with the with the first macro because there are a lot a lot of improvement on on this area. Uh, as you mentioned, now uh, mayors and uh, people from the government are looking at our industry and they are scared about the economic impact because of the pandemic in in all the destinations. But we need to see it in a different way. We need to reflect on this issue, and we need to to strengthen a cooperation, very mature, very, very, very important, very professional with the with the political sector. Uh, there are some countries that uh, we are lucky that we have a lot of uh, collaboration. Uh, we have some laws. We have some regulation about the cooperation between the public and the private sector. But I am sure that there are a lot of room of improvement all around the world. Great point. A couple of things jump out on here for those who heard the first session with Jean-Pierre. Um, the issue around uh, disruption in global supply chains is, I think, going to have a significant impact in trade associations and exhibitions um, as that kind of shrinks down. Um, so it's interesting to wonder, you know, are those big global exhibitions in pick the industry um, still going to take place if the supply chain shrinks dramatically um, into kind of national cores? So you're in that space, Fernando. Do you do you see that happening, or maybe not yet? Yes, of course. Uh, what what we really need to think about is uh, what what is going on with the distribution channels. It means our industry in which way they will relate with the clients. Mainly uh, exhibitions exist uh, because we have a distribution channel and we have a, a company that want to offer a product. What happens if these distribution channels change and now the company is offering the product directly to the client? 
we need to take a look very deeply in every industry and we need to sit together with the industry to hear what they need, what they are needing now, because if not, we will face some uh, losses in the near future. Great. Paul, how are we doing on results? Yeah, I think we should move on. Greg, we've got, we're going to have to do about four minutes per here to get through. We are now going to go to the third macro trends, the final slide on macro trends. All right, great. And Leslie, I've got you teed up here. What jumped out uh, to you on this slide? Well, look at us here. We're using our personal devices and technology multitasking. So that's something personal tech adoption is really something that I think is happening everywhere. It's happening in schools here in the U.S., for example, where the children are uh, learning from home. So all over the world, that's something that jumps out at me. So many things. I think on every association website, you will see that we are concerned about the health and safety of our delegates and our members. And I think that is first and foremost, is everybody needs to be assured that when we do meet face to face again, that their health will be number one priority. And look at it jumping yeah, now. Thing, right. It's really an important thing, session, I think, really for all kind of, of us. Right. In that last session, we kind of talked about the journey, right? The, the journey that our attendees take and how do we as an industry collectively rebuild that trust that your journey is going to be safe um, for you so to important. do this. Toby, let me jump to you on this slide. What, uh, what did you see? For me, what jumps out is the increase of remote working and telecommuting. I mean, I, I believe that with COVID, this is something that was spoken about for years and years as the new normal, the new way of work, but it never took off until COVID hit us. And I believe that COVID has really made it jump leaps and bounds. And we're going to see a more international workforce where you don't have to be sitting in South Africa to be working for a South African company anymore. And I believe that we're going to see a lot of um, office blocks closing down because you don't really need to have an office to have workers. So, and I believe that the technology again, the digital economy is going to enable this to happen quicker. Yep, absolutely. Paul, are we ready to move on? <clears throat> we are ready. We are now shifting to micro trends. So here we are. This is our first of micro trends directly impacting our industry. Yes, we think the macro trends are as well, but we know there's some stuff just happening in our space that are going to have impact for us as we go forward. So the same thing for prioritization on this, please. And Leslie, back to you. Um, first again on, on this slide. Really, it's this is us. I'm trying to vote a high level of uh, number five on all of these, so important. Look at this. Hotels are closing all around us. That's going to give us less ability to contract and negotiate. Uh, open air venues, not as important to my organization, but to many. I think we will see that in the short term. Hybrid events. Look at that off the charts. We're all going to hybrid and virtual, just like we're doing right now. Uh, industry supplies is going to decrease. We have to keep our eye on that. Um, it, it could be anything from food or audio visual. So very important trends here. Uh, corporate travel, ob obviously going to be on hold as we heard earlier for a short term again, let's hope that increases. Um, and how do we measure these outcomes doing the virtual? It's really something we have to learn to do. So look at these trends jumping off the charts as yeah. expected. <laughs> Okay, Fernando, your take on this first group of micro trends? Yeah, Leslie cover more or less everything, but uh, she she let me some. Uh, definitely, the <laughs> the the corporate travel volume is an important issue. We we hold a discussion uh, weeks ago with CBTA, and uh, the, the the good news for the colleagues around the world is uh, corporate travelers are ready to travel again. They want to travel again. The problem is there are still restrictions. It means from my point of view that we'll take a little bit longer to, to recover the volume preview to, to the COVID. Uh, but the good news is they want to immediately come back uh, into corporate travels. 
Great point. Uh, what I find interesting is uh, halfway down, increase in requirement for flexible contractual terms isn't trending as high as I would think it is. Let me just tell you for the customers we've spoken to as part of our research, and we'll be sharing this um, throughout the next six weeks, um, that rise is really high in their level of expectation of doing business. So we're going to be back to that one, um, I think, a little bit more. Paul, are you ready to move on? I think we should just give another minute here, Greg. Just uh, they're, they're coming in a little bit slower. Uh, this is critical okay. feedback for us. Right. So I think that's a big one. And Fernando, back to your point, um, recent surveys that I've seen here with U.S. corporations is an indication of a, a cutback in corporate travel budgets of anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. Um, that's based on two things. Number one, corporations are not willing to send their folks off when we don't have assurance of health and safety. Um, of course, most of that shut down, period. But looking forward, uh, a cutback of 30 to 50 percent, because what else have they learned? We can do business effectively, virtually, digitally, that we don't need to do necessarily all that travel that we did before. So all of that has a group of follow-on consequences for our infrastructure that we need and use and for our events, which they tend to come to. So that means a winnowing down of who's going where, which has impacts on buyers of exhibition space and people in the aisles um, or for a conference. So a lot of issues here. For that, for that reason, Greg, it's very important what ICA is doing uh, regarding the protocols for the reopening of the industry. I, I, I believe that this uh, clear message to the industry global, globally, together with IPC, together with UFI, uh, give us a serious um, um, perspective of, on in which way uh, take over our activity. Great. We ready for slide two on microtrans, Paul? We we, we are ready, Greg. Thank you. So here's the second list of uh, micro trends for everyone to take a look at and give us your reaction to. But uh, Renee, let me come to you first. What on here jumped out at you? Well, um, since uh, a lot of businesses are affected, uh, heavily affected, uh, seriously affected by the pandemic. I think we um, the awareness uh, we, we, probably we can think uh, the pandemic as a a, a wake up call for uh, the meeting industry and then uh, figure out some innovative uh, way or innovative thinking to uh, help us to get out of it. So I I believe um, the pandemic gives the uh, industrial people a chance to explore new possibility to uh, run business in terms of adding value to the technology and the content. Um, so that requires uh, innovative thinking to uh, overcome obstacles. So having to say that, um, I really enjoy the out-of-box section uh, in ICA Congress every year. It is a, I think it is a perfect uh, showcase of how meeting industry uh, can cross over and interact with the ones in the host city. And it is also an innovative way of learning. So uh, by uh, holding this uh, conference and um, continue on the connection uh, uh, with the ECA member, um, we can learn from each other's experience. So, um, I, and uh, I also think the uh, innovative thinking requires a safe and healthy environment. It is very important that the, uh, the business uh, owners create a friendly environment and uh, give a space for out of uh, box thinking and uh, employee feel free and comfortable expressing their idea. So um, this uh, comes to me uh, as the uh, uh, top priority for uh, the government to uh, create a safe and healthy environments. So in, in Kaohsiung, right. we value open and free and creative thinking very much. So Great. And I think that also applies over one of the last slides. We saw that got some traction, this issue of new business models in our event space. And I think we're going to be talking about that a lot more over the next six weeks. Um, Toby, on this slide, was there a micro trend that uh, really resonated with you? There's only 
actually two that jump out at me and they make sense. The first one is the decrease in average size of conventions. Obviously, we know for the next two to three years, we are going to see reduced numbers in, in the size of events. And uh, because of, um, you know, I'm surprised that uh, the increase in relaxation of travel restrictions, I think it will be the opposite. There'll be more restrictions because of COVID and uh, that will impact the, the, the amount of um, delegates at events. But what will become very, very important, conversely, is customer service, putting the customer first and ensuring that the few that you're getting actually come back and give you good word of mouth. So customer as number one priority and less numbers in, in events. Great. Let me just put a point on that. Leslie, I'd like you to come back to me on this issue of decrease in average size of conventions. As you're looking forward to your next, your first event live, um, whenever that's going to be, what are you guessing? And I realize that it's just a guess. Um, your number of attendance or percentage drop is going to be, and what does that translate to in, in actual bodies? Well, as any association planner knows, we have to budget now for the future. So we're estimating 50% less delegates to attend our largest meeting. That's a huge financial hit. We are going hybrid. We are going to charge for the ability to attend virtually. So as that ability increases, the face-to-face -face delegates will decrease. So 50% for you translates to how many bodies are no longer going to be at your international convention? That's over 2,500 bodies that will not be in Boston next year for us. So I think this is really critical for our, our audience to understand. When we come back, we're going to be looking at vastly reduced numbers for our events because of a couple of things. A, the fear of travel that will still be there for a group of our population, whether there's a vaccine or not. And number two, folks who choose to participate differently because we have got to open up the channels for them to do so. Paul, you ready to yes. bounce to our last two? Yeah, on that optimistic note, I guess we should move on. <laughs> so two more slides to do this. This is perfect. You guys are definitely helping us uh, frame out what we've got to be worrying about in the future. So here's our second to last slide on microtrends. And Leslie, I'm going to start with you again um, on this one in terms of what, what did you feel were the, the top two for you here? So I think event design experiences um, are going to be critical. Look at what ICA has done. We've taken a two and a half day conference or three day conference and parceled it out virtually over the course of a few months. That's going to have to happen because none of us can sit here for eight hours a day like we do in a regular meeting. So that's huge for me. Okay. Uh, risk mitigation is another thing here. Risk mitigation is absolutely going to be important. Am I going to be, is my association going to be held liable if people contract COVID or any other illness while they are attending a meeting? So that's going to be huge. And people are looking at waivers and all kinds of other liabilities. So that's very important. Right, but also comes back to some of those contract issues and some of those contract terms. And I'll just reiterate it again. The research is showing yep. this is a number one issue and concern for our clients is this focus on risk mitigation and contract term terms going forward. So uh, as a supplier, venue, anybody else, you need to know that's what the clients and that's what the research is, is showing us. Toby, on this slide, what jumped for you? Um, you're correct on uh, the, the whole contractual um change that we're already seeing it as a venue that uh, clients are expecting us to relax our terms and conditions of, uh, of hire. But uh, another thing that I think we will see a lot of is um, increased competition for subvention funds. With a limited pot of money, we're going to see fierce competition for that limited pot of money. Governments have redirected funds to fight COVID and there's less money for, for events. So I think that will become a major, major uh, micro trend in our industry where governments will need to prioritize which events they are going to support through subvention funds. And uh, we will then have to see how we find other events 
that we've um, traditionally had them funded through subvention. So that is going to be a, a challenge. And um, unfortunately, with also the shrinking of attendee numbers, we're going to see the smaller event venues closing down because it won't make sense, financial sense for them to operate when they don't have uh, the numbers to justify the expense of running a conference center or an events venue. Well, the subvention issue is certainly a hot button for us for, for many, many years. And actually, if that's the case, I don't know that that's a bad thing, right? Should we be making decisions based on other factors anyways, um, both on your side of the business and on our side of the business, right? Should we be basing a decision based on what the destination can do for me in a non-monetary fashion to help me achieve my event goals? And is that how I should be making decisions rather than what? how much am I getting? And so it may, again, as we look at business models, this may be one of those things that changes. And is that such a bad thing? I don't know. Uh, let's. I are don't we ready, Paul? So, do you think to go to our last slide? Oh, let's Toby, give did you another want to thirty on that? seconds. Toby, did you now, want to comment? I was saying, um, I have an opinion about subvention. I not necessarily for subvention, but I know it's a very controversial topic. So. There is a positive or maybe a little bit of a negative, but I'm putting it out there. It's maybe not such a bad thing. Great. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> How are we doing, Paul? Greg, maybe just another 15 seconds and then we can move on. Okay. Great. <clears throat> we have and one last. Yep. Digital pops up again. Yep. Trying to see where the number one is in terms of the most. I guess it's trust, and uh, that's interesting, right? Um, trust implies a whole lot of things about how we do business together and how we're going to partner differently um, going forward. And I think that's another key finding from our research is this issue around trust and selecting the right partners, and that's going to be based on trust. So I do think that's a huge issue, and uh, do we go away from transactional relationships and more towards the strategic? And what does that mean um, for venue selection, for destination selection, for everybody in the um, value and supply chain in our industry? And Paul, should we go to our Great. last slide? Yeah, we're ready now to move to the final panel. Great. And Fernando, I'm going to start with you. And the, oh, no, I'm going to start with Leslie since Leslie's on my screen. Leslie, what did you see on um, this slide that jumped out at you? Um, sorry, I jumped ahead on the last one and said the event design experience. That's what's jumping out to me. Micro events. Let's talk about that. So we may not be doing the big global meetings that we know today. We may do more regionalized meetings, smaller meetings where it's safer to travel and people use the word trust again. We can get on a train or we can uh, take a motor vehicle. So we might see that on the rise in the future. We're already talking about it. Um, and also uh, the economic development and our event strategy, that's going to be really important. What can our delegates afford? What can they, um, what can we achieve on their behalf at, at a price that they can afford? Great, Fernando, how about you on this last slide? Yeah, definitely the, the topic of the numbers pre-COVID uh, sharp to me. I, I believe that uh, we will we come back, but uh, maybe slower than we believed before. Um, of course, uh, the design of the events need to be reviewed. Uh, we were discussing the, this, I, I believe, uh, since years in, in ICA congresses about content. No? Now everything is about content, and we learned that, but when we learned that, the world changed with the, with the pandemic. And then now we need to combine content and digitalization. From, from my point of view, digitalization is not a disruptive uh, factor. It's an accelerator. It's an accelerator of the change. Our business model is still the same. Let me say something, Greg. Sometimes I feel that I represent the dinosaurs, okay? We are the oldest in the industry. I represent uh, thousands of square meters around the world now speaking here. And we want to come back. We want the face-to-face. -face. We want to come back to reality after this nightmare. 
And, and, and I believe that this is also a nice message to share with the colleagues. Of course, the trends are the reality and we need to be prepared, but also we are the ones that can produce the change. We are one of the few industries that we can rewrite our story and we have the chance to write again our story. Great way to take us out, Fernando. Thank you. Paul, did you want to uh, wrap this up from your perspective? I, I think uh, they're, they're still coming in here on this one. Can we uh, ask our producers and beg for forgiveness and ask for another minute to, <laughs> to let people continue to respond? Yeah. They'll be able to do that in the background. Why don't you go ahead and uh, take us from where, where do we go from here? Okay, well, I think, um, first of all, thank you very much for the, um, for the great um, uh, uh, feedback today. This is going to be really helpful to, uh, to us in sort of setting uh, a framework and, and sort of figuring out what are the priorities. There's a lot of things happening, a lot of moving parts. So uh, this is going to be really helpful to us. We're going to take this information today and combine it with the interviews and the research, and then we will... Um, get ready for the ICA sector meetings and shift gears and really focus in on what the strategies that we should be looking at um, moving forward. So that's the next step. Stay tuned for all of the um, notices regarding the next global live event. And um, thanks again. And back over to Greg. Great. So we're excited to go on this journey with you. And the idea of the sector um, strategy sessions is that you can actually go away from those meetings with probably 10 to 20 different strategies that align to the key priorities of the trends that your customers have identified so that you can start talking with your management teams about how do we present ourselves, how do we need to rethink in light of what the research and the data is showing us from um, our clients. And lastly, as we go through this process, particularly with our advisory board, to really start delving into this idea of new business models for our industry. That's where, based on this point in time, this data, we need to have a serious conversation. But the idea about the overall protocol is we want to replicate this as we go forward on our industry. These are the trends and priorities established today. But what's that going to look like as we roll into Cartagena next year? We're going to be able to do this again and benchmark about that. And that's what makes this process um, so exciting that Paul and his team are taking us through. So thank you for playing with us. Um, we're going to do an interactive session just like this with every sector um, on the third week of the sector weeks, and we look forward to your participation in making that happen. Robert, back over to you. Greg, thank you so much indeed for what has proved to be a very exciting session and lovely to see some live voting that does not rely on the U.S. Postal Service. Thank you so much. Well, thank you also for joining us today on the road to Kaohsiung for the ICA Congress Experience launch. The announcement of Incredible Impacts winners, the masterclass in macroeconomics we had, a farm-to-table panel on every stage of delegate travel and delegate trust in travel right now, plus the introduction you've just heard to the Kaohsiung Protocol. Not bad for a start. Perhaps a few lessons on timing for us to learn as we connect up speakers from all over the world. But we are all learning in this virtual space. That is your lot free to air. From here on in, you do have to be registered for the Congress to enjoy our rich content and education. Next week is Storytelling Week. The week beginning Monday, October the 5th is Crowdsource Topic Week. And from Monday, October the 12th, the community will be strategizing the Kaohsiung Protocol itself. There's a further half-day broadcast from this studio on October the 22nd. And then the three main Congress days are November the 1st, 2nd and 3rd. After a beyond grim year, None in the meetings industry have previously experienced or could possibly even have imagined. It will be amazing to gather and stand together, even if we are actually apart. For now, until the next step on the road, welcome. Thank you again for joining us and from all of us here for the moment. Goodbye. <laughs>